Good evening and welcome to this evening's Lundy webinar. I'm Michael Williams, I'm Secretary of Lundy Field Society. Welcome also to the virtual Morisco Tavern uh, for a completely different type of event this evening. Paul Connolly will be joining me to read from My Humble Observatory, a collection of original Lundy poems inspired by the island's landscape, weather, wildlife and landmarks. Paul's going to read a selection uh, from his book linked by brief anecdotes from his times on Lundy. We're then going to have a short Q&A session before judging the Lundy Limerick competition. Uh, there have been over 100 entry entries and we've had a truly entertaining time uh, reading through them. Dave Richards uh, is also going to join us. Uh, we're going to read out a small selection of our favourites before Paul announces the winner. Do make sure that you stay around to the very end, uh, as Paul will be closing this session with a special poem about Lundy that he has written during the lockdown. Uh, I think the whole session should last about an hour uh, and it will be a much more informal evening and I hope you'll find it entertaining. So now on to the housekeeping arrangements. Uh, if you're a regular viewer, then you may wish to charge your glasses while I go through the usual announcement. Only the microphones and video cameras on Paul's computer and my computer are enabled, so we won't be able to see or hear any of you watching at home. Those of you who are on Zoom are able to ask questions using the Q&A function. You need to click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and then type your question into the box that pops up. If you're on a mobile or on a tablet, then you can find it on the menu bar. There's also a chat feature for comments and feedback, which we'll be monitoring during the talk. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you're very welcome, but unfortunately we don't have any facilities for you to ask questions. As ever, Dave Richards is behind the scenes hosting this Zoom session and a recording will be made available afterwards on YouTube. So it's time for me to introduce our speaker. Hopefully Paul will appear. Splendid. Hello, Paul. Hello, Michael. So, a few brief words of biography to introduce Paul. Uh, Paul Connolly is the author of My Humble Observatory, published in January this year. He's also written two novels featuring the island, The Fifth Voice and The Enduring Influence of Ken Potts. Paul has been coming to Lundy since 1993 and his daughter and eldest niece were christened at St Helens during that first trip. He occasionally visits with his family, but for the last 10 years or so, Lundy has become his writing retreat and he is on the island three times a year for a week or two each time. 
Paul lives in Berkshire, just a stone's throw away from the Landmark Trust offices in Shottersbrook. He is also an a cappella singer and a lifelong supporter of Everton Football Club. <laughs> Paul, I'm really looking forward to this evening, so uh, I, I'm going to hand over to you now. All yours. Thanks, Michael. Thanks very much. Let me try to share my screen. Um, let me know when this all kicks in. Are we okay? Yep, it's just starting to come through. It does take a little bit of a while. There we go. Okay. Trying to get it onto full screen. Are we okay now? Uh, we're not there yet, but it, it sometimes takes a while. Yeah, we're there. Okay. Okay. All yours. Good stuff. Thanks, Michael, and thanks for the great introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting me to this session. I've, I've attended most of the sessions through the lockdown series, and they've been fantastic, a really great way of keeping in touch with people um, who have a common love of the island and, and, and the island that we've all missed so much during this uh, crazy time. Um, so I'm going to read a selection of poems um, from the collection, uh, as, as you say, Michael. Um, just a little tiny uh, timeline. Um, I won't go through the, the initial bit. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the novels and so on that also feature Lundy. But just to mention that um, on the 9th of March this year, I, I gave a reading, the first reading of this collection in the tavern in the wheelhouse. And at that time, life was wonderful. The world was normal and, and, and everything was, was just great. Um, I then returned home on the 16th of March and, and uh, uh, Boris Johnson was on TV talking about the, uh, the need to lock down and, and the rest is history. Um, the, in the interim, uh, I, I've actually written a new poem um, called Think of a Time, which I'll read. It's not in the collection, but I will read it at the very end of, of, of our session tonight. Uh, and again, thanks for inviting us all to it. Um, as Michael said, I've been coming uh, to London since 93, so it's quite a while. Um, but it took me ages to realise that it was probably a good idea as a writer that I should start writing about the place I love most. Um, and this is the very first poem uh, that I wrote, um, uh, imaginatively titled Lundy. Ageless rock, you are an ocean jewel, the permanent place of peace and magic that draws me back time and again to replenish my spirit, to nourish my soul. Westerly wild, easterly calm, your unspoiled grace is nature's balm. I tread upon your ground in the footsteps of pirates and prisoners and touch shipwrecked souls on pitch black nights when the wind and rain drive hard and unforgiving. And in summer, when your rare gifts blossom, you sparkle bright and pure, bathed in panoramic azure hues, light everywhere, a painter's dream. Westerly wild, easterly calm, your unspoiled grace is nature's balm. I miss your magic when now and then, a voice in the night, a beacon of light, White, Portland, Plymouth, Biscay, Fitzroy, Seoul, Lundy, Westerly Wild, Easterly Balm, Unspoiled Grace, Nature's Balm. So that was a poem that kicked it all off. It occurred to me when I was preparing for this that um, the poems I'm reading tonight are br broadly fall into four categories. And the first category is all about the business of getting on and off the island which as all of you seasoned uh, Lundiites will know is uh, far from straightforward often. Um, and this is, this, poem, this next poem, A Modric Crossing, speaks to that um, in terms of what sometimes happens when you uh, get on the Oldenburg um, and, 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 and endeavour to cross the, uh, the channel. A Modric Crossing. Sea conditions are described as moderate, said the captain's voice as the Oldenburg reversed in Ilfracombe Harbour, while people settled in their seats, in verity, upright and exposed, waved farewell. Twenty minutes later, the boat was being tossed about on waves in a scene from Moby Dick. And though I thought I knew what moderate meant, modest, medium, middling, this was not. Soon people were turning pale, not so talkative as before, some lying down. And then the crew started to weave expertly around the deck, handing up paper bags, on duty, a routine part of the job. One by one, passengers succumbed, copiously relieving themselves of the breakfast or straining as their stomachs heaved. 
to yield nothing but the acrid sting of bile inside their throats, all the while trying to breathe deeply. Not for me, this sickness, I thought, as I stood with both hands gripped to the deck, feet wide apart, sight fixed firmly on the horizon, as the biggest swell took my innards by surprise and I grabbed the paper bag just in time. Um, this next one, uh, again, talks about the challenge of getting onto the island, um, although not quite in the same way. Um, Paul, sorry to interrupt you. Yes, it's, Michael. It's, it's Michael here. Um, I'm hearing some distortion with your with your audio, and I, I wonder whether people at home are also suffering the same problem. So I'm just going to suggest that you might turn your, your video camera stream off, because it might increase your bandwidth for your sound. Is that OK? Yeah, let me get rid of another computer, Michael. That might help in the, in the interim. OK. I have, I have a plan B computer in the background. <laughs> If, if you could kill your camera and then we can always switch your camera back on later on, that would be great. And hopefully it'll, it'll uh, enable people to hear the audio more. Okay. Great. So Thank how's you. that coming through? It's loud and clear at the moment. So hopefully it will resolve the problem. Thank you. Yeah. I suppose the, the, the more we can spare people my ugly mug, the better it is. So that, <laughs> and this next one is, is called the climb and it's about the, the business of getting onto the island once you've, uh, disembarked from, from the Oldenburg. Down the galvanised metal gangplank, along the wooden boards of the jetty, past the dive shed, gas cylinders, rope coils, towards the road, hugging vertical cliffs, pinned and secured by giant rusting bolts. The road twists and climbs steeply, my head drops, my body leans in, my heart thumps. Behind me, below me now, on the rocky beach, a solitary seal basks, unconcerned by the human influx, while down on the jetty, a tractor loads cargo from the boat. The road turns towards, in towards sparse woodland. A freshwater stream gurgles somewhere unseen, and from the canopy of branches comes birdsong, as the cream-painted face of Milcombe House nestles in the crook of the valley, peeking through, and on to a set of carved stone steps that lead to a still higher path, the final lung-busting ascent to the top, where, as I gasp for air, I can't stop myself from smiling. Those last couple of poems were all about um, the Oldenburg and getting on the island uh, during the, uh, the summer months. This, this next one's called The Spoiling Fog. And the reason there's no photograph with this one or illustration is because this is exactly what you see uh, when a, a big fog does defend on, descend on Lundy, which is white out. This is called The Spoiling Fog. In the sparse timber confines of the embarkation shed, the air crackles as a gaggle of travellers giggle and cavort like children away from home for the first time. Each one rainproofed and backpacked, ready for the seven minute ride while outside a spoiling fog hangs. A walkie talkie sparks up, cuts through, reporting no improvement yet. If it doesn't clear by noon, no flights today. And the air crackles a little less as some turn thoughts to plan B, while others sit quietly and hope that the spoiling fog lifts. Meanwhile on the island, departing visitors pack the tavern awaiting news. Some stare out to sea, dreaming. Others stare at the fire, worrying. Each one rainproofed and backpacked, ready for the seven minute ride, while outside a spoiling fog hangs. Ivy's jacket walks from office to bar, reporting no improvement yet. If it doesn't clear by noon, no flights today. As the dreamers dream of another long walk and the warriors reach for their mobile phones, no one quite knowing if the spoiling fog will lift. Just one more on the, uh, on the theme of traveling. And this is about uh, helicopter season when uh, you're about to get off the island. It's called Big H. Huddled near the Big H, shivering in a bitter southwesterly, Windsock at full stretch, fire truck standing by. The next seven levers gather for final instructions and decide who sits next to the pilot. Looking above the roof line of the black shed and church, high up in the blanket gray sky, a small dot appears, then grows. Its sound repelled for now as the wind blows hard, and one of the seven gets special instructions 
how to ride shotgun on her birthday. Then the sound cuts through, intermittent at first, the telltale thrum of, mo of rotors growing louder, as with insect grace the sleek machine descends, lowers, hovers, tacks against the wind, tips its nose in greeting, then settles softly down against the big H. Ground crew move quickly for the switch. The quad bike tows luggage fro and two. Arrivals emerge, ducking and shuffling to the track. Then the levers follow signals to replace them. As the rotor blades thrash, the engine changes pitch. The machine lifts and spins and angles sharply away. These next few are about things that are uniquely Lundy. When you get on the island, helicopter or boat, what do you find? And the next few describe some very distinctive and unique things about Lundy. Starting with the Morisco Tavern, which is where most people begin and uh, end the stay on Lundy. Um, the Morisco Tavern. No colorful emblems or crests, no crowns, lions or stags proclaim this beating heart of the island. Just a simple painted sign or says Morisco Tavern. Wooden clad bar room, flagstone floor, walls festooned with flotsam and jetsam, life belts, ensigns, ship's bell, the wreckage of yesteryears, paying tribute to lost souls. Rock climbers circumnavigate the center table, divers share stories of Montague and Carpsberg, birdwatchers hope for rare sightings, children play Jenga and Scrabble, lovers discover new romance. Sustenance after long walks, old light and experience, sharing discoveries, listening to the day's tales, fingers on the pulse of the island, the beating heart of the island, Morisco Tavern. Um, one of the things that first time stayers uh, discover um, when they've uh, stayed a night is that something quite magical happens at midnight or thereabouts. Um, well, certainly if they haven't done their homework ahead of getting onto the island, and this is called when the lights go out. Scrabble players miss their triple word score. Jigsaw pieces fall to the floor. Trump cards hover, frozen mid-hand, as darkness makes its swift demand. Words go unspoken as sentences pause, and drinkers spill wine onto living room floors, while books fall from hands and go the same way when the lights go out at the end of the day. Midnight on Lundy, at magical hour, plunged into darkness, drained of all power, Everyone stumbles to bed in no doubt that at midnight on Lundy, the lights go out. Another thing that I've always found very quirky about Lundy properties are the, the prints and the paintings on the walls. Who knows where they come from? Um, they look like an, a, a random assortment of uh, items from car boot sales, and I hope I'm not dissing anybody. But um, this is called The Walls Have Eyes. Shipwreck, mutiny, danger at sea. Rain lashing, sails thrashing, skullduggery. Gigantic waves, smugglers' caves, a transatlantic fleet. These are the things that look down from the walls of your Lundy Island retreat. Storms, tempests, gale force winds, the ultimate sailor's fright. These are the things looking down from the walls in ominous black and white. But look again and you'll see the odd piece that's twee, a basket of fruit or a flower, a fisherman's net, a jelly just set, or a damsel distressed in a tower. And this juxtaposition is not meant as derision. It's there for your personal delight, to bring a smile to your face as you stumble or race to the loo with your torch in the night. This next one is about what happens when you get on the island and you relax. It only takes about 24 hours for me, certainly, and I'm sure it's true of lots of you guys. You get there and you relax instantly. And I find myself focusing on some, just the small things in life. This is called small things. Listening to silence, breathing fresh air, watching the sun rise over the sea while drinking tea. Enjoying the weather, whatever the weather, wind and rain hammering at night, fog enveloping everything in sight. Tracing the arc of a rainbow or the gentle bard of a gull, spotting a ship as it comes into view, parting clouds revealing blue. A chattering of starlings, a scattering of sheep, a basking seal in the landing bay, shimmering light on a hot day. Checking the time on the church clock and being none the wiser, tea and biscuits after a walk, feeling no necessity to talk. Reading a book in the tavern while draining a glass to the dregs, 
then ordering another and another. On the island, I take great pleasure in small things. Of course, London is all about the outdoors, all about nature, all about the magnificent walks that you can take. Wander about at your will. And this is my favourite walk. And it's the simplest walk of all, really, and that's top and back. Leaving the shadow of St John's Valley, checking the church clock to see what time it isn't, risking a broken ankle at the cattle grid, walking through the village, not knowing if the shop's open, counting the tents in the camping field, wondering what goes on in the work sheds, stopping to watch starlings plump and shimmer in the eaves, eyeing the line of dry stone wall as its granite glints, smiling as Gloucester old spots shuffle and shunt in mud. Onto quarter wall as ravens swoop and perch, you slowly graze, following the standing stones as the road winds past the hollow remains of quarry cottages, through unfurling bracken and yellow gorse, past Ponsbury and the red, brown and yellow of cattle lazing. And onto halfway wall and halfway there, past Tibbets, wondering if anyone is staying, taking in the big sky at three quarter wall, onward until the scrub wears thin and the surface rock shines white, the road narrowing, undulating, scruffy soe scurrying, great goat horns silhouetted against the western sun, and then at last a sense of getting there as the road peters out at the thin end, the top end, where the only way is back. The next few poems are inspired by uh, personal experiences, as you can imagine, having been on the island lots of years, there are stories that stick in your mind some of which have, have inspired poems, and, and this, these are just a, a couple of, of those. And the first one's called The Baptism. And it uh, relates what happened back in 1993 on that very first visit, um, something that we didn't expect to happen at all. Because the last thing in our minds was that uh, uh, the children would get baptized, but nonetheless they did, and this is how. He stood on the threshold of Government House, a biblical apparition with beard and staff, come to calm the souls of the island's newest visitors. PJ, island chaplain, over from Appledore, eyed the playing infants and saw an opportunity crawling before him. Peering over the top of his old Chelsea Ironstone teacup, he quizzed, have these children been baptised? And upon the answer, no. He smiled and suggested, though it seemed more like a command, St. Helena's 2pm Tuesday. And so Georgie and Helena came to be baptised Numbers 37 and 38 in the registry, welcomed into the family of the church and given the lifelong gift of Lundy. Just a quick explanation of that uh, illustration on the right there. That's a photocopy of the page from the uh, baptismal re registry. Um, Georgie and Hannah um, highlighted there. And um, those of you who've been uh, coming to the island for years and years will recognize the names at the top, John and Wendy Puddy, who obviously had a couple of their kids uh, baptised in, in 89 and 91, we can just about to see. And the name of the chaplain, um, I'm sure lots of you remember, is a guy by the name of the Reverend Donald P.J. Peyton uh, Jones. On to the next one, and this is called The Haunting. This relates to the story of probably the worst week I've ever spent on Lundy. Um, it's a family trip. We got up to the top of the island. I instantly felt ill. And I spent the whole of the next week in bed in a very poor state. It turned out subsequently that I'd contracted um, food poisoning on the mainland and it wasn't fun. And this is the story of what happened, or at least one of the things that happened during my delirium um, on that week. It's called The Haunting. In the still of a stifling July night, I trudged, sweat soaked from bed to bathroom once again in the grip of some abdominal turmoil. And in my delirium, as I edged through the darkness, I sensed that I was not alone. In the living room, I felt a palpable presence, and my heart froze as ghosts appeared, lining the walls of Square Cottage. My hands reached in front of me to keep the ghosts at bay. And in my fear, despite my fear, I needed to know my fate. Who's there? I asked at last, at which the presence shifted and moaned, and spoke to me, chilling me to the bone. It's us, came a voice. Who, who are you? What do you want? I gasped. The tent blew away, so we let ourselves in, came the voice of my sister. Another revelation for me uh, was the whole business of birdwatching. Lundy is absolutely famous for birdwatching. Loads of people come for that very reason. 
And for years and years and years, I really didn't get it um, until just a couple of years ago. And this is the story of that revelation. It's called Fresh Eyes. Previously, my only brush with ornithology was on a university field trip many years ago. In a Devon woodland, we wore magnets on our heads, an experiment in avian migration. After that, nothing. After that, not so much as a passing curiosity. After that, ornithological oblivion. Then one day on the island, I opened my eyes to the skies, opened my ears to the wind, and suddenly it was different. Until then, our feathered friends were invisible. Until then, bird watches were weird. Until then, binoculars were a weight around my neck. My first sightings were a revelation. Sparrow, starling, swallow. And the next, majestic, orchestral, hovering, hunting. Now I see it. Now I get it. Now I have fresh eyes. And this next one is the last one of the experiential uh, poems, shall we say. I was lucky or unlucky enough to be on the island in 2018 when the beast from the east swept in. Uh, I'm sure you all have memories of that, but it was particularly uh, harsh on Lundy. Uh, wouldn't go, it wouldn't be going too far to say that it, it was actually life-threatening. Um, and this is called the beast from the east. When the beast from the east came calling, the island sat in the eye of a storm, battered by a polar wind, fierce and lacerating, driving snow hard across the channel. When the, when the beast from the east came calling, a boat was swept aground and made matchwood. Water pipes froze and burst. The generator failed and snow drifted under the door. When the beast from the east came calling, I fixed blankets against the door. I went to bed at noon with hot water bottles, wearing three pairs of socks and a fleece, while the snow painted white fractal patterns at the windows. When the beast from the east came calling, the walk to the tavern was an arctic expedition, trekking through the whiteout, fighting the beast as ice crystals raised my face, slicing, exfoliating. When the beast from the east came calling, and I was cozy by the tavern fire, one of very few who ventured out, it occurred to me that discretion was better than so I borrowed a walking pole and went home before it was too late. If anyone's wondering, that picture there is uh, a sketch of the interior of the bedroom in the Blue Bong and propped up against the um, pillars there are two hot water bottles and that's approximately two o'clock in the afternoon. That's how bad it was. On to the last few poems and these celebrate the, um, the buildings and the landmarks of Lundy and I'm sure you all know them so, so well. This one's called The Old Light. 200 years ago, the old light was built on the highest point of land, tall, proud and implausible. Its lantern 500 feet above sea level, a towering white elephant made of granite. 200 years ago, the old light, island icon, dominated the landscape, standing with its head in the clouds, the opposite of what it was meant to be, a hazard to shipping. Those of you who know the story of the old light will know all too well that uh, it's a lovely idea, but it didn't work very well. And uh, thank heavens we have the uh, the North Light and the South Light these days to, uh, to make good. This is one of my favourite uh, Lundy properties to stay in, uh, the old school, otherwise known as the Blue Bung. Six granite steps and a corrugated carapace of blue. The old school nestles against the battlement wall above St John's Valley, a colourfully conspicuous feature of the gentle eastern slopes, an escaped parakeet. A painter's aberration in a moment of frustration a tin pot, dare to be different dwelling, an iron and timber anachronism. The one time Sunday school, one time drinking den, this cobalt curiosity looks out across the sea and boldly suggests, come be my guests, step into the blue, you know you want to. And the reason why this is the only photo or illustration that's in color on, in this presentation is because I wanted to illustrate, for those of you who don't know it, how very blue the blue bong is, Although I do believe it's a slightly uh, muted shade of blue at the moment, um, but a beautiful little dwelling it is. This is probably the property on the island with the, with the most magnificent views, uh, Hanmers that looks down upon Brat Island and all the way up to the north uh, along the east side. Um, and this is called a view from Hanmers. Looking down upon Brat Island, snow spume dashing against the dark rock. In the foreground, the jetty, Skeletal, quiet, expectant, and beyond, 
Countless waves rise and fall, tearing bone white slashes in the broad green canvas of the Bristol Channel. The wind whips northwards, driving banks of cumulus cloud that throw shadow cloaks upon the sea's green. And then within seconds, the clouds thicken and all is gray as dense rain falls and swirls, shrouding everything in sight. A minute later and the clouds shift once more, parting this time to allow bright blue patches to appear as though an unseen artist was adding the final touches of color to a painting entitled A View from Hanmer's. I'm sure many of you remember 2015 um, when the Anthony Gormley statue uh, uh, was, was, was up for a year. Uh, days four, I believe it was called. And it divided opinion somewhat. Some people hated it, didn't think it belonged. Some people loved it. And I was one of the latter. Um, and this is called the Iron Figure. Looking out from Stonycroft, across the green swathe towards the southwest point, where the island gives way to the squall of the channel beyond, I see a solitary figure standing resolute against the elements, just visible through a familiar hanging mist. And as I walk towards the figure, expecting movement, there is none. It stands sentinel, solid, stoic. It will be there night and day, through battering winds and rain, and then again when the sun blazes upon its cubic form, casting shadows, but only for a year. I wonder, is that time enough for the island to permeate its ferrous skin and imbue it with the same sense of wonder I feel every time I'm here? And so I come to the final poem in this main session uh, before I hand over. And this gives you everything you need to know about why the collection of poems is called My Humble Observatory. Maybe one of two of you had wondered why. This gives you exactly the reason why. This is called My Humble Observatory. I stand stock still, head raised in awe at the ink black sky and the myriad stars that jostle for position, each one a pinpoint reminder of how small we are, how little we know. And this, my humble observatory, puts Greenwich and Jodrell to shame. For surely the outside urinal on Lundy Island has the best view of the universe in the world. Over to you, Michael. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, really fantastic, really evocative uh, words there, which have really I think conjured up um, so many memories of the island because of course they are all memories for us all at the moment because uh, we can't be there. Um, so thank you so much for that. Really, really enjoyed listening to you. Um, before we go any further, um, switching your camera off did has significantly improved the audio, but it is still a little bit um, distorted at times. So I was going to ask if if you if there's if you know where if there's anywhere where you might be able to relocate to where you could get a better Wi-Fi signal. Oh, that's tricky without um, causing considerable disruption to the proceedings, Michael. So uh, I was if if you are happy to do that, then I can I can do my normal promotion of the Lundy Field Society. Why want to give you a few moments to uh, relocate yourself? But I think it would help the sound if if you were able to do that. But if you feel that you can't, then then we'll just we'll just carry on. Let me try something. You, I'll try what you you go on, and I'll um I'll try something. Okay, so I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask uh, Dave to just mute you for a moment, and I'll go through my uh, my um promotion of the LFS. So um, while, while uh, Paul sorts himself out, so I'm going to um, share my screen. Um, so hopefully uh, everybody at home will be able to see this. So normally at the end, uh, I, I get my, my plug-in to say, all these talks are brought to you courtesy of the Lundy Field Society. Um, we've had a fantastic response to them so far. Um, we, we've had a, a number of new members join us, but of course, there, I'm certain there'll be many of you out there watching this evening who haven't yet joined the Lundy Field Society. So please do support these talk, talks by joining us. Uh, membership is open to all. Um, you can find out more by visiting the, the LFS website uh, or finding us on social media uh, and all the details are on the screen. So uh, please do join us and, and support, uh, support uh, the work of the LFS, which of course includes these talks. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, see how Paul is getting on. So, Paul, how are you doing? Have you been able to relocate? Um, can you hear me, Michael? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, um, I'm afraid I tried plugging into an Ethernet cable, except the connectors on this computer aren't aren't the right ones. So you're going to have to live with it, I'm afraid. Um, okay, well, we'll, per we'll persevere. Um, so uh, we'll have a go at switching your camera back on so that people can see you for the Q&A session. I think if, it, if we struggle a little bit, then... Um, uh, then I'll ask you to turn the camera off again, but uh, hopefully we'll we'll persevere. So uh, I can only see the top of your head at the moment. <laughs> That's better. Great. Well, we've we've we had some uh, some some comments in from from our viewers as we went along. Uh, Joanne Wilby says, "Loving these poems, wonderful. I recognise so much of your experience and descriptions of my favourite place. Uh, I think when you were reading out your poem about the haunting. Uh, your, your sister has uh, made a comment that Forsyth put paid to our camping career on Lundy. <laughs> uh, Jenny Williams, that's my mum, says thank you Paul for such a really entertaining evening. Uh, I've got some questions in as well. So uh, Jane John asks, uh, well she says uh, we, we've really enjoyed listening to Paul who is able to vocalise our thoughts and feelings about Lundy so evocatively. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jane would like to know where she can obtain the book. Yeah well um, Lundy opens up on, on whenever it opens up the 11th of July so those of you lucky enough to be visiting soon will be able to pick it up in the in the Lundy shop uh, otherwise it's available um, on Amazon or by order from any bookshop. Thank you. Yeah, so Lundy opens on Saturday, actually, on the fourth of fourth of July. So it's uh, it's this coming Saturday that Lundy reopens. Um, if if anybody wants to enter questions uh, from home, then please do drop them into the Q and A Q and A box at the uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've got a few more comments coming in. Um, uh, uh, Helena Britton. Was it Helena whose christening took place on the island? Indeed it was, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, Uncle Paul, that was so beautiful and funny and heartwarming. We're all sat here in Brum planning a trip. You've painted the most wonderful pictures with your words. Lots of love, Helena. So great to hear uh, from I must, you. I must just say that I didn't plant these. I mean, okay, it's family, so maybe it doesn't count. I don't know. But <laughs> <hey>. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Everybody's welcome to these talks. Uh, <laughs> Jan Paul would like to know who did the illustrations. Um, there were a bit of a hodgepodge really throughout the presentation, but the ones that uh, are in the book uh, are all um, they're basically computer computer renderings of photographs that I've taken myself down the years. So you can get some quite clever software these days to actually uh, make photographs look like um, sketches. Um, so basically, that, that, that's that's what happened for the book. Although I threw in a few other things for the for this evening's presentation. I really enjoyed the Blue Bung poem. Uh, the Blue Bung is one of my um, favourite properties on the island, and yeah. uh, I was uh, uh, as you as you were reading it out, I was it was conjuring up all these images from my memories of the Blue Bung, and I was thinking <laughs> it'd be great to have that poem hanging on the wall along with all of the other bits and pieces oh. that hang on the wall in the properties. <laughs> Wouldn't that be an honour? Yeah. Um, uh, Gary Bridge says, love that, thank you, humble observatory, totally agree. Um, uh, what an awesome urinal. <laughs> yeah, it's just the simple things that uh, are wonderful and, and the Jensen on Lundy is uh, one of my favourite places. Isn't that weird to say? <laughs> Uh, I, I must admit, the times I've taken friends there, they, they, they've always been. Uh, they, when 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 new people visit the island, and of course they don't know where the toilets are, they wander around the tavern trying to find the loo. And eventually, when they can't find it, they they ask and say, "Well, where's the toilet?" And you point point outside, and the gents always come back to to report on what they've seen and what they found outside. <laughs> well, so I haven't got any more questions. Oh, I've got another question come in here, so. Uh, Joe Joanne Welby again says, uh, "Do you write the poetry generally alongside your novels, or is that an activity just restricted to Lundy?" Um, 
It's, it's been so random. I, I, the first poem was like, must have been ooh, 10, 12 years ago. And it was, it, I then wrote a batch and then didn't for, for several years. And I focused on writing the, the novels. Um, it was only in the last year or two, I went back to the poetry and, and, and wrote a, a batch more. Uh, fresh inspiration, don't ask me what it was. But um, anyway, it was only at the end of last year that it, uh, I came to the conclusion that I had enough to publish a collection. And so, yeah, a bit more random, but normally I'm focused on the novels, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, we've got a couple more questions come in. Um, so uh, John Tyra, hello, John. Uh, he asks, do you write while you're on the island or does that come later? No, that, I mean, these days that's in, entirely what I do when I'm on the island, unless, unless you know, once in a while I come across with um, my daughter and, and my sister and family, um, which is only maybe every one or maybe two or three years. I, I'm there on the island writing entirely two or three times a year in big chunks of time, so that's, that's where the work gets done. And it's only at home that I do the editing, but... Um, I should just say to John, reluctantly, um, congratulations on Liverpool winning the um, winning the league. <laughs> I said that with a heavy heart, but anyway, hi, John. I'm sure I'm sure John will be cheering at home. <laughs> uh, Brian and Lisa Woodcock say it was lovely to meet Paul in March when we bought a copy of your book. It really is a super one. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, so you've talked about uh, the Blue Bung, and I think you were talking about Square Cottage, wasn't it? When is that where you were staying when you when in the haunting? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul Dubler uh, asks, um, really appreciated your writings. What about Big St John's? Well, oddly enough, that's the place I stay most, and and maybe that's what prompted the question. If 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 if, uh, if you knew that, um, I don't know. Big St John's is fantastic in terms of the view and. You know, you get that wonderful view down the valley and across the channel. It's not the most inspiring of buildings, I have to say. But <laughs> it, it probably, alongside the Blue Bung, is, is my favourite, just because it's it's an old favourite. It's a friend, you know. Yeah, so I, I love the building. Uh, Sue and Jim Maguire say, thank you, Paul, for a really great presentation. We can relate to the messages in some of your poems, but we're also thinking about things we never considered before. Thank you very much mm. for enlightening us. Oh, that's that's lovely. Thank you. Uh, Peter Long asks, uh, any plans to write uh, about how much we've all been missing Lundy? Well, um, mm. at the very end of this evening, um, I will be reading uh, one final poem, which is called Think of Time, which was inspired by the lockdown. I wrote it quite early in the lockdown when it, it occurred to me that exactly this would be the case, that lots of us would be missing the island. And um, who knew how long it would last? But you know, thank heavens it's it's reopening now. But it was written at a time when nobody knew, so it, it's my reflection on that whole thing. And I'll I'll read that hopefully in, in the next twenty minutes or so. Yep. So so um, Peter, at the very end, uh, 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 Paul's going to read us a final poem. So uh, do stay around right to the very end. Uh, John Tyre has come back and says thank you. He's got his Liverpool um, t-shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> just to rub it in. <laughs> uh, Ali Shepherd, uh, I remember staying in the Blue Bung. I just read The Fifth Voice and I was thrilled to read your entry in the logbook and realise that you'd been staying there before me. Thank you for a great presentation. I love the London oh. poems and we'll buy the book when I'm next over. Oh, thank you. So, uh, good promotion as well. <laughs> it's not what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Carol Lee. Hello, Carol. She says, when are you next expecting or hoping to be on Lundy and any chance of a live poetry reading then? Um, I'm scheduled to be there in mid-October. Um, that's booked. So unless we have some crazy second spike or whatever, then that's where I'll be. Um, and yeah, I'd love to do another reading in the tavern. Yeah. And so I think it's between the, yeah, the middle couple of weeks in October anyway. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're there and you do a reading, it'll, of course, be advertised uh, on yeah. the notice boards. Yeah. So look out for those if you're on, on Lundy in the middle of October. Uh, Leslie McLean, uh, thank you for thoroughly enjoyed these. Uh, I wrote a Lundy poem back in the 1980s. I may pick up my pen again. I have been oh. inspired. And there's no bigger compliment. There's no bigger compliment. Thanks very much. 
Uh, Leslie's lucky enough to be going back to Lundy on the 11th of July and it's going to take uh, a pen and paper along, so uh, <laughs> that's great news. Okay, well, so uh, there are no more questions and answers um, uh, sitting in the queue, so I'm just going to pick up a, a note from Joanne Welby again. Uh, she says, I also developed my love of bird watching through visiting Lundy. Despite having two sisters who are very interested in bird watching, it was the enthusiasm of a fellow bell ringer, Peter Fleckney, who inspired me to take up bird watching. Now I'd rather be out looking for birds than ringing the bells. Uh, and uh, Sue Maguire says uh, she agrees with my comments about displaying the poem in the blue bung. It's one of their favourite properties too. So um, oh. let's see if we can get that arranged, shall we? That would be wonderful. Okay, well, I think now it's time to move on to the to the Limerick competition. So uh, just to let people know how this is going to work at home. So uh, Dave has magically appeared on the screen. So hopefully you can see Dave. Hello, Dave. Hello. <laughs> Good to have you here. Well, well, I mean, I know you're here all the time, but not not very often do people get to see you. <laughs> So uh, just, to, just to run through how it's going to work, I'm going to hand over to Paul, who uh, is obviously going to do a sort of brief introduction. Uh, we're each going to take it in turns to, to um, read, read some of the um, limericks that have been submitted that, that we enjoy, and then, and then Paul's going to announce the winner. So uh, Paul, I'm going to hand over to you again. All yours. Okay, Michael, after I do this intro, you want me to read the, the three? Highly commended ones, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, it was Michael's great idea to, um, alongside my reading, to have uh, a bit of fun with uh, a limerick competition. I think the origin of this is when uh, he had a Lundy Field trip, um, Field Society trip, uh, some years ago, and they they had a, a limerick competition. If I if I remember correctly, Michael, from what you'd said, um, it seemed a great way to get everyone involved. And, and from what you say, you know, there's been a magnificent number of entries well I know because I've been through them all um, well over a hundred and um, it's been great fun just sifting through you myself and, and, and Dave um, and um, what we've done is we've selected three each that that you've um, kindly entitled highly commended which sounds like a very formal competition doesn't it um, and then so I'll read three now and um, then hand over to, to, to you guys to read your own and then at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll announce the winner. But just to reiterate what you said, Michael, it's been, it's been great fun. And, and um, thanks to everyone for participating. It's really, you know, added to the spirit of the whole thing. So the first one I'm going to read under the highly commended category is from um, Grant Sherman. Hello, Grant. Hope you're having a great time on the, uh, on the mainland. Um, and it goes like this. There once was a farmer called Kevin who worked on an island off Devon. To help himself sleep, he counted some sheep, but never got further than seven. On to the next one, which is from Anne and Tony Taylor. I uh, really like this one because it brings out uh, the, the wildlife angle. Um, and it goes as follows. The puffin agreed with the rabbit concerning their burrowing habit. And like the young lark, are kids safe in the dark where a crow or a gull cannot grab it? Great stuff. And the third of mine um, is from Carol Lee. Hi, Carol. And it goes as follows. I once stayed at Tibbetts in June, watched the sunrise and set, and high noon, but it seemed way too far to get to the bar and return by the light of the moon. So those are mine. Over to one of you guys now. Yeah, it's me next. So again, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. It's uh, great fun and uh, not not my usual role. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, thanks for all the submissions as well. Had great fun reading them. Uh, the first one I've selected is uh, by Jan Paul. And it goes like this. There once was some fine Lundy cabbage, though by roadies and deers it was ravaged, but keen volunteering and all persevering the cabbage does thrive with no damage. And then uh, moving on, uh, next one that I chose was by Ali Shepherd, and it goes like this. There once was a young seeker deer who roamed the east slopes, but with fear. But when lockdown occurred and no visitors were heard, he came up to the village for a beer. 
And then finally, from my selection of three, uh, it was uh, by uh, B. Cox. And uh, I, I should also admit to being a bell ringer at this point, I suspect. In the tavern with a pint of old light, we were having a fabulous night, but the bell ringers were there. They drank the bar bare and failed to get home by midnight. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much. Uh, as you can see, we've had, we had, there were so many limericks to read through. We had uh, such tremendous fun over the last 24 hours or so, trying to sort through them all and, uh, and work out uh, which ones we wanted to read out. Uh, we ended up with quite a long list, but uh, we managed to whittle down our own selections. So, uh, so my turn now. So um, the first one I selected was from Joanne Wilby again. Uh, Joanne writes, now the kingdom of heaven is swell. It's the island we all love so well. But poor sailors get jumpy when the channel is lumpy, as the journey can often be hell. I think many people will, um, will reflect on the, on, on the sentiments expressed in uh, Joe's limerick. Uh, so the next one is from Paul Sawford. Now, Paul, this is this is a great submission. It's, it's very relevant for, 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 what's, for what we're doing here at the moment. Paul writes, so here I am confined to my room, enjoying these great stories on Zoom. But the boat goes next week, so it's time to go seek the Lundy cabbage, which is now in full bloom. So I think the people who are visiting Lundy in the, in the coming weeks will uh, certainly be able to, to enjoy the, the remaining flowering uh, Lundy cabbage. Final one from me, uh, which is a great reflection on the current circumstances we're in. Uh, it's from Viv Ellis, who I think is uh, Rosie's, Rosie the Assistant Warden's uh, mum. Viv writes this. When the last copter left Lundy Isle, staff remained on their own for a while. They stayed isolated till COVID abated and now welcome you back with a smile. Looking forward to seeing everybody <laughs> when we next get over. So those are, those are our sort of highly commended selections. Um, Paul, it's now over to you to uh, announce the one that uh, you've selected as our head judge, uh, uh, as the winner, over to you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, well, it was, it was just a very difficult thing to do and as, as always with these types of competitions but I think the winner I think we it, it just nicked it because it was in five lines which is all the limerick is it, it sort of managed to encapsulate what so many people feel about Lundy um, the journey of getting there the magic of being there and the whole business of not wanting to leave and, and really encapsulated within five lines and this is from Jackie Guthrie and it goes as follows. Now the journey might just leave you queasy, especially when forecasts are breezy. But once you are there, you really won't care. It's the leaving you might not find easy. And that's our winner, Jackie Guthrie, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations, Jackie. Um, we, we have a mystery prize uh, available. And um, so uh, uh, Sue Waterfield, the, the, the manager in the Lundy shop, uh, Lundy General Stores, I should call it, uh, uh, is, is going to provide you with a, uh, with a, with a small prize. So uh, Jackie, I will drop you an email after, after the session to, to get your address and I'll pass it on to Sue uh, so that your, your prize can be supplied. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know what it is, which is why it's a mystery prize. So very many congratulations, Jackie, uh, on that wonderful winning entry. I think it really does sum up uh, uh, the Lundy experience for many of us. Um, and thank you everybody else for, who's entered uh, in such tremendous spirit for, uh, for, for what, what I hope has proved to be a good bit of fun. Uh, I, I've been in touch with B. Cox uh, about uh, passing some of these limericks on to her. So we, we hopefully will publish a few more in the, uh, the next uh, Discovering Lundy Bulletin, which will be out uh, at the end of the year. So thanks, thanks again. Uh, Dave's already disappeared. So, um, Paul, is there anything else that you want to add about the Limerick competition before we before we move on to our, our closing remarks? No, just thank you for everyone's enthusiasm and great work and, and, and just 
getting in the spirit of it, spirit of it all. It was, it was just great to see. Thank you. Okay, so um, before Paul reads um, his poem written during the lockdown that's going to close our session, there are a few things to run through. Uh, on Thursday, so in two days time, we have an extra special webinar. Uh, Anna Kay, Director of Landmark Trust, and Derek Green, Lundy's General Manager, will be here two days ahead of Lundy reopening following the lockdown uh, to explain the arrangements that Lundy's put in place so that we can all enjoy the island again. Details have already gone out by email and on Facebook, so do sign up to the Zoom registration page. Uh, we've already had a lot of people signed up uh, and I'm expecting lots of questions. Uh, so we're going to have an extended Q&A session so we can cover as much ground as possible. Um, before I hand over to Paul, I also wanted to let you know that Thursday's session is going to be the last in the series. Uh, it will be the 12th webinar I have run. Um, and with Lundy reopening, I think it is time to pause. Uh, and I say pause because there has been so much tremendously positive feedback about these talks that I plan to restart them in the autumn uh, on a less frequent basis. Uh, I have another dozen potential speakers lined up, so there is plenty to look forward to. Uh, of course, if we do uh, end up in this lockdown situation again, then, then I may review that. But currently, I'm aiming to restart these, these talks in the autumn. I hope we can enjoy the summer that's ahead of us. Uh, when I started these talks, uh, Dave and I were discussing what might be a good turnout, and we agreed that getting 50 people would be considered a success. For the first talk, if you cast your mind back to Simon Dell in April, we had 180 sessions going, which meant that there were probably about 250 people watching, uh, as I know many people are watching with their partners and families. Uh, for me, it was quite a nerve-wracking experience watching the viewing figures go up just before we went live on air. We've averaged a similar number each week with a peak of 240 sessions for Henrietta's archaeology talk. That was by far the, the highest attendance. So, and thank you to everyone who has emailed feedback and completed the survey uh, each week. Your support and your questions are, are, are the things that really make this a success. Of course, talking of surveys, if you're joining us on Zoom, then you will receive a link to a feedback survey when this session ends. So please do complete it. Thank you, Paul, for a lovely evening and a completely different approach uh, to our usual format. Thank you. And thank you also to Dave Richards, uh, who has hosted the Zoom session as ever. So I hope you've tonight enjoyed tonight's webinar. Thank you very much for your company. Uh, I'm going to go hand over to Paul now to read his closing poem. Over to you, Paul. Thanks a lot, Michael, and, and many, many thanks for, for the incredible work that you've put in to put this series together, uh, you and Dave both, and, and, and everybody else that's been part of it. It's been, it's been magnificent, and, and we look forward to the whole series resuming in the autumn. Um, so anyway, this is the, the final poem. It was inspired early on in the lockdown, and I think it speaks to what we've all been feeling in relation to Lundy. It's called Think of a Time. Think of a time you left your cares in Ilfracum or Heartland and were transported, mind and body, to the special place where existence is simple and time hardly matters, where expectation and duty are imposters, where nature takes the upper hand and the clamour of daily life is hushed. Think of a time you walked the island with just your thoughts, one step, then another, your horizons vast and magnificent, the scent of gorse in the air, meadow pipits rising and trilling, the precocious wind play fighting with a warming sun as you busied yourself with simply being. Think of a time you watched the sun rise over the sea, setting the island alight with the promise of a new day, the earth rich with overnight rain, gulls spilling and calling, a lingering fog burning off at last as you busied yourself with nothing. Think of those times as the world slows down, as isolation weighs heavy and dark thoughts brood. Go to that place in your mind, breathe the scent of gorse, see the meadow pipits rising, because you've been where life is simple and time hardly matters. And you'll be there again one day, being busy, simply being. <laughs>